Welcome everyone to Uncovering Hidden Risks, How Vendors Create Supply Chain Security Risks for Your Organization, a webinar by LMG Security. My name is Tamara and I'm your moderator for today. Our presenters for today are Sherry Davidoff and Matt Duran. Sherry Davidoff is the CEO of LMG Security and the author of three books, including Data Breaches, Crisis and Opportunity. She is a certified penetration tester and forensic analyst and a graduate of MIT. Sherry has been called a, quote, security badass by the New York Times. Matt Duran is the Director of Training and Research at LMG Security and a Black Hat USA instructor. He holds his computer science degree from the University of Montana, and his malware research has been featured on NBC Nightly News. Sherry and Matt are co-authors of the new book, Ransomware and Cyber Extortion. Sherry, I am passing you control of the webinar. Thank you so much, Tamara, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're going to start off by, by giving a major update on one of the biggest supply chain hacks uh, from the past few years. That is the Blackbaud case. Then we're going to introduce the framework for, ma for managing supply chain risks from NIST, which we're going to be referring to throughout the rest of the program. From there, we're going to dig into a bunch of different case studies. This is a really fun walkthrough through a lot of different types of supply chain data breaches that have occurred. Everything from a tech infrastructure provider getting hacked to a marketing firm to cloud providers, IT service providers, MSPs, and more, and even more non-technical suppliers as well. Finally, we're going to conclude by talking about the five steps to supply chain risk management and how you can reduce your risk effectively and efficiently. But first, let's jump in. Just recently, the SEC announced a $3 million settlement with BlackBot. And I don't know about you, Matt, but I was surprised. I was like, wow, that's really low. And then we started talking about all of the other issues uh, that BlackBot is still working out with other regulators. So to back up for a second, BlackBot has been one of the leading providers in the world of software as a service for organizations that are tracking and managing and collecting things like donations, doing fundraising. So they work with 80% of the most influential nonprofits, according to their website, right before they got hacked, one out of three Fortune 500 companies. And in 2020, they were hit with ransomware. So this was very impactful, not just for BlackBot's customers, but for the millions of people whose information was in that platform. Here's what happened. In February of 2020, hackers broke into BlackBot's organization, and unfortunately, BlackBot did not detect them right away, not until May, when the criminals detonated ransomware and stole data. Now, the criminals did make their presence known, and apparently, BlackBot paid the ransom demand. We know this because in July of 20, 2020, they provided a customer notification. And as you can see, BlackBot said, we paid the cyber criminals demand with confirmation that the copy they removed had been destroyed. So all set, right, everybody? No problem. The criminals promised they've destroyed the data. We are all done. Nope, unfortunately, we're not done because what do customers have to do at that point? Well, customers have to understand who is at risk of a breach and make appropriate notifications. Many of BlackBot's customers, such as healthcare organizations, are subject to notification requirements and need to let people know if their information might have been compromised. Unfortunately for BlackBot's customers, BlackBot did not provide clear information at the time. So customers needed to know what data was affected. What exactly happened? Was that data actually stolen from the system? Was it just viewed? Could they rule out a breach for a certain subset of users? And the answers still have not been received to this day. In fact, in our recent ransomware class, we were lucky enough to have some students that shared their experiences. They were handling security and response for organizations uh, that were customers of BlackBot. And they said, right now, three years after BlackBot announced that they had been hacked, they still did not know exactly what subset of data the hackers had access to or what happened. So that is shocking. Um, and as we'll see, unfortunately, the BlackBot case is not an isolated incident. Now, over the next uh, few months and years, more and more organizations have announced that they were hacked because of this or that they had experienced a breach. Everyone from the Boy Scouts to Texas Tech, various colleges and universities, um, nonprofits, healthcare institutions. You can see that a hundred of a hundred healthcare organizations announced a breach because of this. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the hackers had access to all of these patients' information. 
What it does mean is that they were not able to rule out a breach uh, because of the way that HIPAA and high tech work. They need to presume a breach has occurred unless they have evidence that shows otherwise. And then came the ripple effects. For example, uh, Rady's Children's Hospital is now facing a class action lawsuit from some of their patients because they had notified them of a breach. So you can see we really do have to worry about our supplier security because it affects all of us, including the people that we serve. Again, the SEC settlement was just a drop in the bucket. Uh, Blackbaud recently announced in their SEC filing that they've received 260 customer reimbursement requests, 400 reservations of the right to seek expense recovery. In the UK, they've received notice of proposed claims. Insurance companies are working it out in court. They're filing subrogation claims because if they had to um, front up the money for expenses, they might want to be reimbursed. They're now, Blackbot is now a defendant in 19 punitive consumer class action lawsuits. That's a lot of money that's going towards legal defenses. 49 state attorneys general in the U.S. plus the District of Columbia have banded together in a frightening coalition, and they have uh, they've they've served Blackwad with a civil investigative demand. And separately, California did the same thing. Blackwad is also under investigation by the FTC, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of Australian Information Commissioner, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. But they've settled with the SEC for three million dollars. Um, Blackwood also gave us just a taste of what their expenses have been uh, by announcing that in 2022, two years after this breach occurred, they incurred $55 million in expenses relating to the incident. Again, that's just two years, and that's a single year um, that this has happened, and they expect to see expenses continue. This is just one of many examples of how your risk is your vendor's risk. And when your vendor gets hacked, it's your name, your reputation, and your money on the line. Recently, AT&T alerted 9 million customers of a data breach. Was it AT&T's network that was hacked? No, but it's their name on the line. They had to do the notification. Turns out it was actually a marketing company. So this is a pretty good example of the fact that even our non-technical non providers, professional services firms, marketing companies can impact your security. And we also need to think about what types of data different suppliers are handling. Often we require vendors to handle regulated data like health information or social security numbers very, very carefully, but things like email addresses, maybe not so much. As we've seen in many cases where marketing companies are hacked, and we'll look at another one later, even email addresses can be enough to really get a lot of attention. Because if a hacker has access to customer email addresses, they could potentially reach out to them directly, conduct phishing attacks, extortion, things like that. So you want to really think about uh, not just whether or not information is regulated, whether it's personally identifiable information, but also what will the impact be if this information gets leaked. We're going to talk today about all kinds of suppliers from that marketing company to cloud hosting providers like Blackbaud to software vendors, technology infrastructure providers, managed service providers, and more. And with all of them, proactive supply chain management is key. I do want to mention the NIST cybersecurity framework has a subsection on supply chain risk management. We won't go into this too deeply, but I want to bring it to your attention because we will refer to it throughout this program. It has five different steps to managing supplier risk. And I've summarized them on the left. This is my summary. Develop your processes, know yourself and your suppliers, delegate your requirements through contracts. If it's not in writing, it's not gonna happen. Assess your supplier risk consistently. And finally, integrate suppliers into your response planning. So we're gonna to touch on all of these as we go through our cases today. And feel free to let me know if you have any questions along the way. So let's jump right in. Um, when we talk about developing your processes, uh, that starts with identifying where is your supplier risk management program going to live? As you can see in this chart from Venminder, about 26% of the time, it tends to live within risk management or a risk committee. So if you're a small business, maybe you don't have a risk management department, consider forming a risk committee with appropriate individuals that can help to oversee this effort. 16% of the time it lives within information security, which makes sense, or 14% of the time it lives within compliance, both very good options as well. A smaller percentage of the time it may live within legal and IT. 
And once you've established where it's going to live, you need to assign responsibility and roles. Make sure you're establishing appropriate security standards for your vendors and you have a process for vetting. Um, you want to make sure you're tracking on industry standards and updating your program regularly because security never stays the same. And then finally, review and revise your program on a regular basis. If it's helpful for you, um, CISA has a vendor supply chain risk management template out there. So check it out. I've included the link here. And there's many other templates available as well. NIST also has a whole document, NIST 800-161, that really goes into excruciating detail on supply chain risk management. It's a great resource. Today, we're going to keep it a little bit simpler and really just talk about those five key items. All right. So let's jump right into one of our case studies, GoDaddy. GoDaddy is a perfect example of how often um, organizations get surprised uh, because many of them don't realize who their critical vendors are. Back in December, many GoDaddy customers um, were taken by surprise because all of a sudden their websites were being redirected to criminal websites. This can, of course, have a big impact on your reputation and also sometimes on your revenue if you make revenue like you're an e-commerce site or something like that. So GoDaddy started doing an investigation and they finally announced that yes, they had been hacked. In fact, they had been hacked multiple times over a period of multiple years. Back in 2020, a GoDaddy employee fell for a phishing attack. And as a result, criminals were able to access about 28,000 GoDaddy customer logins, as well as credentials for a small number of employees. Uh, over a year later, a hacked GoDaddy password enabled criminals to log in and steal things like source code, uh, customer information pertaining to millions of customers, website administrator passwords, private SSL keys, and more. So again, we're seeing that repetition and that breaches can lead to more breaches. Interestingly, um, I, uh, we are seeing a ton of compromised passwords, and even though we see those addressed with multi-factor authentication, many of the supplier breaches that we're going to examine today are all being traced back to a hacked password, so keep that in mind. Finally, in December of 2022, hackers were able to gain access to the GoDaddy cPanel hosting servers that are used by customers. They installed malware on them and intermittently redirected customer websites to different places, to malicious sites. So that's the bottom line, what happened. Um, unfortunately, GoDaddy did not do the greatest job in their breach response either. So it took them almost three months to share with customers that they had been hacked. And during that time frame, customers only had a limited ability to protect themselves. They didn't know what was going on. They also did not include technical details or indicators of compromise that customers really needed. And that's what we saw in the Blackbaud case as well, where there's often no contractual obligation. And while customers expect to receive the full support of their supplier when they're investigating, the reality is that it can be like pulling teeth when you're trying to get information like that from a vendor. But perhaps the biggest underlying issue was that, again, many of these GoDaddy customers had not really been tracking on GoDaddy as a supplier. And one of the reasons for that is that most folks in an organization do not see GoDaddy. It's easy to say, yes, Microsoft is a supplier. We are using SharePoint. Everybody sees that. Often your GoDaddy relationship only lives within the IT department, and so often it's overlooked. And yet still, it is a critical relationship, especially for organizations that really rely on their website. So step one um, is to know yourself, know your suppliers, make sure you understand where your data lives, what your critical assets are, and that you make a list of all those. You will not be able to tackle everything all at once. You will not be able to assess all of your suppliers as often as you would like, but start with the most important ones and then work your way down. If you only end up assessing and tracking five or 10 of your most critical, critical suppliers, that in and of itself will dramatically reduce your risk. Here's a great chart by Venminder. They show that almost a third of companies have 100, 101 to 300 suppliers that uh, they are tracking. And many have even more than that, hundreds or even thousands of suppliers in their program. It's very, very hard to manage all of those supplier relationships. The good news is that there are tools to help you do that, tools for third-party risk tracking. And here's just a few examples. There are many others. There's Venminder, OneTrust, Vanta, BitSight, lots and lots of others. And each of these have slightly different features. 
If you have any questions, by the way, feel free to drop us a line on LinkedIn. We're more than happy to provide advice and guidance. Um, what works for one organization may be different than what works for others. Here you can see some screenshots from BitSight uh, that show a vendor action plan, um, companies that are undergoing monitoring, more companies that are going, undergoing review, and then a smaller subset that are escalating. Maybe there were some issues that were not acceptable to the organization that needed to be tracked or you need to have discussions with the vendor. So how do you understand who you really need to focus on? Again, it all comes back to having information classification and resource classification. So you want to be able to classify the different types of data that you have, know where it lives. That's key. We like to say conduct data mapping and asset inventories on a regular basis. You have to know what you have in order to be able to protect it. And if you don't know what you have, then you're definitely not going to be able to identify your suppliers. That is really fundamental. Also think about your availability requirements. It's not just about classifying your data, classify your resources as well. It's going to be more important for you to keep that mail server up and running than it is for you to keep a workstation in the marketing department most of the time. So make sure you're tracking all your assets, especially those pesky clouds app, cloud apps. Often people sign up for a cloud app. It becomes critical. Maybe central IT doesn't even know about it. And then when something happens, the business is in a bind. So again, you want to make sure you're really involving uh, people across the organization, getting an accurate list of your suppliers so that you can prioritize them and vet the ones that are truly important to you. Let's dig into some of the causes of supply chain compromises. This was a great chart that was put out by Mandiant last year. As you can see, the number one cause of incidents was software exploits, but interestingly, 17% of the time intrusions were caused by supply chain compromises. Now, if you zoom into that, you'll find that 86% uh, of the cases that Mandian analyzed um, under the supply chain umbrella were all related to one incident, and that is solar winds. You really can't talk about supply chain compromises these days without talking about solar winds. So what is solar winds otherwise other than the fact that it's synonymous with uh, software supply chain compromise? Well, solar winds is a technology vendor. They make a very popular piece of software, the Orion network monitoring software that's deployed by thousands and thousands of organizations around the world. And in December of 2020, they announced, really one of their customers announced that there was a backdoor, there was malware embedded in their product. And not only that, the malware had been deployed to over 18,000 customers, it turned out. So over 18,000 customers had malware in their networks that would enable hackers to just come straight in. Now, how did this happen? Well, it turned out that SolarWinds had been hacked for a long time. In fact, they had been hacked since at least December 2019, and criminals put their hands on the keyboards and found that they were able to insert code into the product. They started off by doing some tests, and then in March of 2020, they actually deployed a backdoor in the product, which their customers did not catch. It was downloaded by 18,000 customers as part of an update. Now, again, SolarWinds did not detect the malware, which really makes you think about the logging and monitoring infrastructure of your suppliers. You want to make sure that if you're running software in your environment, that the organization creating that software has a really robust threat detection uh, process. They are monitoring for issues and they will catch malware being inserted into their own product. It turned out it was a customer that found it who notified the public uh, and then everything, everything exploded from there. The impacts were huge. Again, there were 18,000 customers, and some of these were very, very high profile. The White House announced that nine federal agencies were impacted. Microsoft was hacked as a result of this. The hackers were linked to Russia, by the way. We believe that that's uh, where this originated from. Banks were affected, tech companies, hospitals, universities, and more. Everyone was scrambling. Here's just a small fraction of the companies that were hacked from, again, health insurance companies to the Department of Defense to telecommunications providers. Microsoft put out an analysis and found that 44% of the companies that had installed the SolarWinds backdoor were information technology companies. And that is scary when you think about supply chain security, because once hackers break into an IT company, well, they could then potentially break into their customers. And even if you clean up that original malware, what's to stop the criminals from installing a new backdoor? So that has affected our systemic risk to this day. 
Matt, you've had some really, um, really great observations on what people could have done to have reduced the risk associated with solar winds and other software like this. Can you share some of your uh, observations with us? Of course. So one of the big things that made the solar winds compromise so bad, one of the things that made it, uh, you know, reach so far into all these networks that solar winds was installed in, was the level of access that solar winds products were provided inside of that specific network. In a lot of cases, it's running under administrative credentials, meaning it can access pretty much anything inside the network. And in addition to that, in a lot of those cases, the solar winds platform was also excluded from things like antivirus and anti malware scans. Uh, this really just kind of underscores the importance of. Going back to the, you know, the basics of cybersecurity, the principle of least privilege, we need to look at the access that we're giving vendors inside of our network, and we need to restrict that access down to what they need to actually perform their job roles and not more. Uh, if we open the door too far, things like this are inevitably going to happen. Yeah, it's definitely important, and you can reduce your risk just by reducing your access. All right, let's take a look at another example of cloud software that gets hacked. So NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, experienced a major outage late this summer. Um, and it happened because one of their key vendors, Advanced, that provides the um, Adastra EMR, Electronic Medical Record System, they were hacked by a ransomware gang and their system was totally taken offline. This was a disaster for the UK um, and for their health system. As you can see from this screenshot by the BBC News, staff were resorting to writing their care notes on paper. It was just piling up. It didn't have anywhere to go. It was slowing down healthcare. Patients were getting redirected. Procedures were getting delayed. It was a mess. Now, the good news is that Advanced uh, took responsibility and they also provided details in their disclosure. So they gave out dates. They said the earliest evidence of the threat actor activity was on the 2nd of August. The most recent was the 4th August of August. The threat actor initially accessed the Advanced network using legitimate third-party credentials. So let's think about this a second. This is our third party telling us that this is a third-party breach. So really for NHS, this is a fourth party compromise where a fourth party had their credentials stolen and that was used to get into the advanced network. And then the attacker moved throughout the organization, copied and exfiltrated some data and boom, detonated ransomware. They disclosed that this was associated with the LockBit 3.0 gang and said they are happy to share additional in indicators of compromise with advanced customers. That is how you do it, people. That is what, you're, what you want your vendor to say. They volunteered, they offered, said they had indicators of compromise. And those are pieces of evidence that would allow their customers to search for evidence of the attackers and understand whether the attackers get any more access and uh, what else might have happened. So right here, Advanced is supporting their customers in the response, which is good. Now we have seen um, case after case after case again where it's the hacking is occurring because of compromised accounts. And that holds true even in this chart provided by Kaspersky where they did a study and they found that the second most common form of entry when the attackers break in is um, hacked accounts. So stolen credentials most of the time, 18% of the time. So what can we do to prevent this? Of course, use multi-factor authentication, not just for us, but we want to require our providers to use multi-factor authentication as well. That can dramatically reduce the risk. Just to refresh everyone's memories, when we authenticate, we are verifying someone's identity. And we do that in three ways, with something you know, like a password, something you have, like a key fob or a phone, something you are, like your fingerprint or your eyeball, something you know, something you have, something you are. And when we use multi-factor authentication, we're using multiple factors combined in order to verify our identity. Now, these days, just using multi-factor authentication isn't enough. Hackers have found very effective ways to bypass certain kinds of MFA, in particular, SMS, text messages, email, and phone calls. So if you can, use stronger methods of authentication, like a hardware token or an app, and try to avoid using text messages, emails, or phone if you can at all help it. If you have any questions on this, see our webinar on Beyond Passwords, where we really go into depth on authentication and how you can best, most effectively deploy it and protect yourself. 
And then once you understand what your requirements are, of course, you want to delegate them through contracts. Now, this can be tricky, but it starts with establishing standard contractual obligations for your vendors. And you want to include both security and response obligations. So what do they need to do to adhere to security requirements? And then if there is a hack that involves them, what do you expect them from them? How do you expect them to support you in the response? Do you want evidence? Do you want indicators of compromise? What is the time frame that you're anticipating for notification? You want to make sure you're tracking any changes from your baseline contractual, contractual obligations and then review those periodically. And yes, it's easiest to do this in the initial procurement phase, but with most of your vendors, you're probably beyond that phase at this point. So pick a time, maybe on an annual basis, to review your high priority contracts and uh, add in any appropriate provisions. This is not outside the norm. This is something that many, many organizations are doing today because everyone is starting to recognize that supply chain security dramatically affects your security as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what exactly we expect of our providers from a security perspective. A good example of this is LastPass. Matt is here to walk us through the LastPass breach and then to talk us through those underlying issues and how they could have potentially been prevented. Matt, take it away. Thanks, Sherry. So when we're talking about LastPass, we have been notified of a couple of different data security incidents with them over the kind of recent past. In August of 2022, we were notified about a data breach inside their network. And the information that was taken from the, uh, the network was fairly telling as to what criminals had access to. They were able to get copies of encrypted password vaults, so not clear text, encrypted, but they were still able to get them. Uh, there was user information that was exfiltrated, and some of their source code repositories were also accessed and exfiltrated. If you've heard us talk about zero days before and the threat those pose, the loss of source code can be a major contributing factor to that. As it turns out, though, there was a second data breach happening right around that same time, and we just recently were, uh, were made aware of this one. Uh, in this case, there was a specific employee at LastPass, one of their senior uh, development and operations engineers, who was actually targeted here. Uh, once they, uh, the employee was taken over, the, uh, the employee's access was leveraged to basically hijack a lot more on the network. This included things like more of those encrypted password vaults, API and third-party secret keys, which we'll talk about the relevance of that here in a second, and then their MFA seed information. Now, how did this second breach happen? Well, the uh, the engineer in this case was running a media server on a home computer called Plex. And this is a fairly common piece of home software that we see for media organization and for media centers in general. However, the Plex media server was out of date and was, uh, was susceptible to a zero day attack at that point. I was also exposed to the public internet. Now, this specific employee was one of four employees inside of LastPass to actually have access to their corporate vault using the credentials that he would uh, normally use to access the system. Uh, attackers were able to hijack that media server, put a key logger on his computer, and because of that, they were able to hijack his master password for his LastPass repository and his MFA code. So they were able to bypass multi-factor authentication at that point. And we've talked about before, and I, I'm sure Sherry will talk about this as well, the importance of things like phishing-resistant multi-factor authentication. Yes. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot that goes into that. And there are some great ways that we can more effectively secure these systems using some of these more advanced types of MFA. And honestly, they're in a lot of cases, easier to use than having to dig for a code or something along those lines. So, right, because the hackers were able out. to see the code that the employee yep. was typing in and grab it, right? Exactly. And by this time, we've already known that our, our national government has already come out quite a while ago and said, use phishing resistant MFA. So not that everybody has to be Fort Knox, right? You know, we're probably not all in that situation. But if you're one of only four employees at LastPass that has access to the corporate vault, like the keys to the keys to the kingdom, you might want to really be locked down. Like that one person might want to be Fort Knox. And LastPass probably should have revisited access from home networks and security of home systems and things like that in this case. Yeah, we've, we've been part of more than one case where an insecure home device has been kind of the cause behind a compromise. And it's <laughs> it's uh, it, it, it's an easy so it's an easy problem to solve if you are up on your policies and there's an expectation that you will maintain a baseline level of security with your uh, the devices you're using to access corporate assets. It's amazing to me that one employee with one piece of outdated software could create this huge worldwide problem where the passwords of so many organizations are at risk. I mean, this could lead to the hacks of many, many different companies. It so, absolutely could. Yeah. All right. 
to wrap this up, tell us about the damage, Matt. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the damage here. So what we're talking about here is the type of data that the attackers had access to, and then kind of what you might need to do to protect yourself from, well, becoming compromised based on this. The data that uh, was accessed here was inside of uh, LastPass's Amazon S3 infrastructure. This is their cloud storage system. Uh, encryption keys for those S3 buckets were stolen from the engineer, and they were used to exfiltrate data from that uh, that repository specifically. <clears throat> now, the data that was exfiltrated in some cases was in clear text. In other cases, it had uh, a decryption key stored along with an encrypted version of the data. So that's something that we, we also want to talk about as we talk about general data security. Uh, I want to be clear about this. The password vaults that were taken were backup password vaults, and those are encrypted. LastPass does not maintain your password or any of the information about your password on their system, uh, which makes that less of a risk. It's still a problem, but it is not as if uh, a bunch of uh, clear text passwords went out the door. One thing I also want to point out about this is that uh, identity and access management was the cause of the detection here. It didn't stop it, but it was how LastPass learned that someone was uh, accessing their S3 infrastructure without uh, without authorization. So if you're if you're looking at steps to take on this, I uh, highly recommend that you reset your master password for your LastPass password vault. Uh, if you want to if you want to go an extra step and go for you know an abundance of caution approach, go ahead and reset the passwords that you have uh, that you have stored in that repository as well. Yeah, and identity management, identity and access management, as we've talked about recently, is crucial. Um, but there are different ways that it can be used in different levels of maturity. So ideally, you want your suppliers, especially ones that have critical data like your passwords, you want them to have deployed IAM in a way where they will not only detect problems, but they're able to prevent them as well. All right, so let's talk um, about another type of in issue where the software itself is vulnerable. And that'll lead us to a discussion of how we assess vendor security. So we know vendor security is important. We wanna delegate it through contracts. How do we know that our suppliers are actually doing what we want them to do? For that, let's look at an example, Namecheap. Um, Namecheap in this case is the customer of another marketing email provider, SendGrid. So they use SendGrid in order to send out emails on their behalf. And unfortunately, just last month, Namecheap customers started getting flooded with phishing emails from Namecheap. In fact, they were legitimately from Namecheap domains. And so what was going on here? Well, it turns out that their provider SendGrid was actually hacked. And um, that, unfortunately, the hackers were able to break into the software and then leverage it to actually send uh, emails to Namecheap customers, which then cheapened Namecheap's name and made them look bad. I couldn't help it. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, now, this is not specific to SendGrid. In fact, it's an industry-wide problem that there have been vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the software run by many of these companies, which is kind of crazy when you think about the access that they have. MailChimp, Mailgun, lots of others. Matt, tell us about some of the issues that you've seen. So the big issues that we're seeing here really come down to things like poor application design and poor security. Uh, when we're talking about how uh, services like SendGrid and MailChimp and Mailgun interact with someone like uh, with Namecheap, they're basically provided with an access key, an API key that their software can use to interact with Namecheap's system and send emails on their behalf. If the application being used to do that is not coded properly, or if there are security holes in that, that API key can leak. Uh, CloudSec is an organization who uh, who does research on these uh, these kinds of security vulnerabilities, and after a recent study found a really large number, about 50% almost, of the applications that are available on the Google uh, App Store, which act as kind of a, a go-between for sending email on another application's behalf, were leaking these API keys. And when I say leaking, I mean they were able to be recovered by, a, uh, by an adversary just by kind of watching the behavior of the software. If an adversary gets their hands on that API key, they can interact with that software as if they were you or as if they were that application, meaning they can, uh, they can perform any task that it could. In this case, they use those leaked API keys to send emails through Namecheap system and try to fish all of their customers. But again, very, very common misconfiguration and common security hole we see in a lot of applications. Now, this could have easily been prevented with something like a web application penetration test. I mean, we do them all the time. We see issues like this occur, and then the uh, the provider has a chance to, to fix them. 
So it's a good idea to assess your supplier's risk. This does not mean that you have to do a security assessment. It means you need to require your suppliers to do that assessment and then to provide you with at least a summary. And again, I can tell you that this happens all the time because at LMG, we do web application penetration tests. We do, um, we often do them for suppliers and we provide them with a letter of attestation, a short summary of exactly what the test was, what the findings were, who we are, what our credentials are, and they provide that in turn to their customers. So don't be shy, you guys, about asking for the results of application security testing. It's the only way to really verify that your suppliers are doing it. And if you're relying on a specific piece of software, then absolutely, it is your reputation and your data on the line, and you should feel comfortable and confident asking for that information. And if they aren't already doing it, then that's a red flag, and you might want to talk to another provider uh, as well. Um, uh, while we're on the topic, I also want to mention that uh, we have many people that contract out and get custom code or custom applications written. And we are seeing more and more uh, hacks occurring because of web application vulnerabilities. Often we're relying on developers, maybe outsourced to India or someplace else. And you expect, of course, they've got this covered. Security is uh, implied. We, we're definitely sure that they're going to use a secure software development lifecycle. And then you get that application through testing. And often it's a mess and there are a lot of holes. And you want to correct these as early in the development process process as you can, but definitely before you put those applications on the internet and they get hacked. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you're having custom code or custom applications written, make sure you get a web application penetration test so that you know what the vulnerabilities are and you can fix them before you actually put them out onto the big bad internet. Okay, one question that we got earlier today was how do I identify fourth and fifth party suppliers without fancy tools? Good news, you don't have to do that. Instead, it's not possible, right? I mean, I wish it was, um, maybe. But you can't know all of your supplier suppliers. It's hard enough to get your arms around who all of your suppliers are. What you do need to know is that your suppliers are correctly and effectively managing their own supply chain. And so that's what you should be checking. Hey, supplier, do you have a, an effective supply chain risk management program? And you might want to ask them uh, if your application is being hosted in a third party's or well, a fourth party system or something like that. Um, in fact, we were working with a number of credit unions several years ago when all of a sudden they discovered that one of their key applications was being hosted on Amazon and they had no idea. They only found out because Amazon went down and all of a sudden the software they were relying on went down. So it's certainly reasonable to say, hey, if you're going to be hosting our information on some third party, fourth party system or fifth parties, we want to know about it. Absolutely, that's a reasonable thing to do. But really, you want to make sure that you can't directly manage all of their suppliers. And so you need to make sure they have a strong program. If you're wondering how exactly you know what to ask your vendors, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are many effective supplier vetting questionnaires. One of the most popular ones is called the SIG, the Standardized Information Gathering Questionnaire. It is created and shared by a, a private company, Shared Assessments LLC, very widely used. And the SIG Lite, a slimmed down version of that, is also a popular option. Also, if you're using vendor risk management tools, often they have these checklists built in that you can use to vet your vendors. And they're very easy to use. You can, with a click of a button, get a link out to a vendor. They come back and they fill it out in your tool. And then everything, you can do that without having to get manually involved, which is very helpful. And you can also ask your suppliers for copies of any security assessments that they have. It's a really good idea. Suppliers should have routine security assessments. I can't stress this enough. It is not your job to do an assessment of every single supplier. And in fact, a lot of them are really used to being asked. Um, when we first started, uh, in penetration testing. I myself have been doing it for 15 years. And in the early days, we used to have to ask permission to test someone who is hosting their software in Amazon. We no longer have to ask permission and get a letter that's signed and all that anymore. In fact, Amazon has a policy that says, yes, you can conduct penetration tests of applications hosted in our system. It is absolutely routine. So ask your suppliers, um, big suppliers like Microsoft or other major providers are used to these questions and they have pre-packaged answers that and packages of uh, reports that they can provide to you if needed. So um, yeah, make sure they're having routine security tests and that they're not just answering a questionnaire. 
All right, when we talk about fourth and fifth party risks, one of the main places where this comes up is with software vulnerabilities. Remember the log4j issues from a, a year or two ago, where all of a sudden, nobody even knew what log4j was before this happened, but we all found out there was a vulnerability in this popular library that was used by many, many different vendors and integrated into their products. And it was so hard, the whole world scrambled just to figure out which products were using log4j. And by the time vendors were able to figure it out and notify their customers, often their customers were already hacked. So this was a major scramble for everybody. And unfortunately, it happens not just with Log4j, but with many other types of dependencies. So Matt, why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about software development and how fourth party software can be developed, it can be embedded in code. Sure. So when we're talking about the uh, the ingredients for the software that you use in your uh, in your network that you rely on for your your you know normal business operations, there is a very good chance, in fact, almost a hundred percent chance that the software you're using likely contains some repository that is an open source code repository 101%. or an open source code package. Yeah. Uh, and these are these are very common when we find them in uh, in, in application development. I mean, a, a software developer is not going to write from the ground up every piece of code that goes into an application. If that was the case, we would never get anything done. So they're going to rely on open source software packages. Again, very, very common in a lot of different applications. One of the ones that we'll talk about right now is the NPM repository. Now, NPM is the package repository for a piece of software, or I'm sorry, a software architecture called Node.js. This is very common on the internet. Uh, in fact, it, most websites tend to have some components of this included, along with a lot of web applications. Uh, when we uh, when we look at the packages being used on the back end of this, it's an open source repository, which means anyone can really go in and uh, and interact with this. And unfortunately, that also means well, that also means there's probably going to be someone malicious getting in there from time to time. Uh, an example of this is what's called a or a sorry a package planting attack. Uh, and a package planting attack is one of the more kind of insidious ways that attackers will, will get their malicious code into these repositories. What they'll do is they'll create a malicious package. Uh, they'll make it look like something that would be you know, used for a part of a larger piece of software. They will add it to a repository, and then they will add trusted maintainers to that project. In one of the examples we looked at, the uh, the researchers added organizations like Facebook and Microsoft as the maintainers here. And in a lot of cases, the maintainers don't actually get a notification that they've been added to a project. That's just not how the system works. The adversary then turns around and they will remove themselves from the project. And now we have this piece of malicious software, this malicious package, sitting in a repository that looks like it's maintained by two normal, reputable organizations. And uh, other people who are building software may download that and include it in their application. They now have poisoned their own application because of it. Really hard to spot. And there are hundreds of these packages that pop up on kind of a monthly basis in these, uh, in these uh, repositories themselves. So something you need to be very careful of and something you need to understand when you're talking about things like custom applications application development, or anything else that involves open source code. The yeah, other thing is, like, yeah, go imagine ahead. your developers are baking a cake, and they get some eggs from the fridge, and they don't realize the eggs have E. coli or whatever eggs have in them. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you have a food poisoning issue because one of the ingredients is infected. That's exactly what's going on. So exactly. Really, you want to know what ingredients are in these products, right? So that if there is like an issue, you can tell if you're affected. So yeah. Take it away with the S-bomb. That could be helpful. Yeah. And what we're talking about here is the software bill of materials, the S-bomb. As Sherry just mentioned, this is basically the ingredients list for your software. It tells you what exactly is being used for all those things that are running inside your network. Because it's not always apparent right off the bat whether or not there's something that is potentially a risk. Uh, you may not even know a uh, poison piece of software is running inside your environment until it's too late to do anything about it. Now, S-bombs in general were a big topic of conversation at the beginning of 2021, uh, and that was right when Log4j was coming out. Uh, we were starting to see all these uh, you know, big open source repositories being targeted or being leveraged by bad actors. Uh, and it has been a continued topic of conversation. Uh, the government is now putting requirements in. If you are going to be doing business with them, you have to provide them with an S-bomb. Uh, I would assume we'll probably see the private sector go a similar way. And you as a consumer should be asking for this information. This is something that you should be getting from your suppliers because, again, you need to know what's running in your network. Uh, if your suppliers are reluctant to provide that to you, or if you just want to verify what they have told you is actually inside the software they've given you, then there are some great options out there to help you kind of generate these on your own. Uh, one of them is going to be Microsoft's SBOM tool. It's available for free on GitHub. It runs through PowerShell. All you have to do is point it at an application, and it will tell you what's in there. There's also some commercial products that can help you along with this, too. Uh, we've got Sonatype, we've got Sift, we've got MergeBase, and many, many others. 
Now, I wanted to take a second and show you kind of what this looks like. So here's an example of generating a software bill of materials using something like the SIFT application. And this is just running off of one of my research workstations. Uh, so I decided to uh, take a look at what was going. Uh, when we uh, when we run SIFT against our just normal repository, we can see we've actually got over a thousand packages that are active on the uh, on the machine at any given point in time. And we can see where they come from. These are NPM packages. We can see the version. We can see the name of the, uh, the application. So if something goes wrong or if there is a security risk with one of these, I actually have a record of what's running on my system and I can work to either uh, prevent that from becoming a problem in the first place or I can respond appropriately to it. Now, to make this a little more clear as to what we can do with this, I went ahead and pulled a piece of malware off the dark web and decided to see if I could create an SBOM for that too. And as it turns out, yes, we can. <laughs> Uh, the screenshot you see in the bottom is a Rust-based remote access Trojan that I pulled off of a hacker forum. And here are the packages and dependencies that are going along with that. It's also interesting to point out, even hackers are relying on these open source code repositories to build their software. Uh, so yeah, anyway, a uh, little, little anecdotal there, but figured that would be interesting to show. So do you think the hackers had to patch their malware so they weren't vulnerable to Log4j? Oh, I'm sure they probably did, yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Um, okay, software vulnerabilities, of course, can have huge implications, and we've seen that recently. For example, Patch Bank just announced um, that 140,000 customers had data stolen. That was all happening because of a zero-day vulnerability in a software product they rely on called Go Anywhere. Now, ironically, Go Anywhere is security software. It's designed to facilitate secure file transfer. So you're using this software. It has all this very sensitive data in it, and hackers break in because of a zero-day vulnerability, and they get that sweet, juicy data that has highly regulated or sensitive information. So unfortunately, it was a perfect target for hackers. Now, um, vulnerability exploitation is the number one way that we are seeing organizations get hacked these days. So you must, must be prepared for this. And one thing to realize is that in most cases, you can reduce the risk of a zero day vulnerability simply by not exposing that software product directly to the internet, by minimizing, segmenting your network is another example. So in the case of Go Anywhere, um, there was actually only a small subset of customers that there were only a small subset of customers that were actually hacked because of this. The reason is that the administration port, the administrative interface that was vulnerable, didn't need to be exposed to the internet. In fact, most customers configured it so it was only accessible within that organization. And you can see a quote here from a Rapid7 executive, while the administration port should not be exposed to the internet, it's very easy to configure it that way by mistake. So how can you catch errors like this and catch cases where your, your risk exposure due to third-party software is higher than it needs to be? Well, monitoring and patching are critical. Make sure that you're monitoring your attack service. You're doing routine vulnerabilities, not monthly. Monthly vulnerability scans are not going to happen often enough. You will get hacked in between those monthly scans. Instead, you want to be doing continuous vulnerability scanning. Feel free to talk to us if you have any questions or need help with this. Um, but you really want to be scanning on a regular basis, in my mind, at least daily, um, to make sure issues haven't popped up. And that also help you verify your verify your patching. We see we saw a lot of organizations getting hit because of the exchange vulnerabilities, which they thought they had patched. And they unfortunately hadn't actually, maybe there was an error in the patching process that wasn't caught or things like that. So just scan that external interface on a regular basis so that you notice if, if there are any issues and you can reduce your risk. All right, let's really dig into what goes on inside the vendor's organization when a software vulnerability is discovered. Kaseya is a good example of this. So Kaseya uh, makes remote management and monitoring software that is widely used around the world. And unfortunately, it had multiple zero-day vulnerabilities. Hackers were able to break in and the Revo ransomware gang deployed ransomware and locked up over a thousand organizations. In fact, I think the estimates were 1,500 organizations from towns to grocery stores to healthcare clinics, credit unions, and more. Now, a lot of these victims never made the news because fortunately, the hackers do not appear to have actually exfiltrated data in most cases. And so most of the victims were not required to report it as a data breach, but we did see some operational impacts of this as a result. According to the Reval Ransomware Gang, and I don't know how much I trust criminals, uh, they actually encrypted over a million individual devices. And honestly, sounds plausible to me. 
Now, again, let's look behind the scenes a little bit. This could have been prevented. So the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure, researchers there found at least seven zero-day vulnerabilities back in April of that year and disclosed them to Kaseya. And so this is normal. When a vendor finds out about a vulnerability, they can't immediately fix it. They got to work on the patches. And um, they had a 90-day disclosure agreement with the researchers. So on April 10th and May 8th, uh, the Kaseya developers were able to patch four vulnerabilities, and those patches got rolled out. And they were about to patch the remaining three vulnerabilities when the hackers struck. So it was actually just before that 90 day disclosure agreement was up, which makes me personally suspicious. Like, were the hackers aware of this somehow? Did they, had they gathered this information either from Kaseya's systems or the researchers' systems? Who knows? Now, there are absolutely ways that Kaseya could have reduced the risk by suggesting configuration changes, which is exactly what happened after uh, the zero-day vulnerabilities were announced. But it's interesting because if you have critical software um, in your environment, you want to understand how quickly is the vendor going to jump on the patches? How quickly are they going to be able to roll them out? Will you be vulnerable for 90 days after a zero-day vulnerability is discovered? That might be something that you want to know. And if you can, put it in a contract. Also, in these cases, we're actually, Kaseya is a fourth party provider for most of the organizations that were hit. So most of these victims had a third party provider, like an MSP, that picked the Kaseya software, a fourth party provider, and then they deployed that within our customer network. So most of these customers did not have a direct relationship with Kaseya. Instead, they were working through a third party that selected and vetted that vendor. So just something to keep in mind. Again, we need to be asking our suppliers how they vet their suppliers. So what are some questions for our managed service providers? Of course, we want to know who's on call when an issue like this occurs. According to FireEye, in 76% of cases, ransomware is deployed after hours, like in the evenings, the weekends, holidays. On July 4th, who's going to be available to respond if you need help, especially if you're outsourcing your IT? And then you also want to know, are your MSPs monitoring for vendor updates like this? Are they monitoring threat intelligence? Who within your MSP would be notified of this and available to jump on this and assist you? Once your MSP knows, how quickly are they going to notify you, right? There's this whole downstream notification process. And then finally, the big question, how quickly are they going to patch a zero-day vulnerability in your software? And how is that affected if they have hundreds or thousands of customers that have the same vulnerability? So just something to think about, questions to ask your MSP. Speaking of MSPs, let's see how things can go sideways in the event of an issue that relates to an MSP. Matt, do you want to walk us through this case? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so the, the case that we're going to talk about here actually has a lot of parallels with the Kaseya uh, Rebel outbreak. <clears throat> One, because this was a Rebel ransomware case, and two, because the MSP in this case was actually coincidentally using Kaseya, which does not mean that Kaseya was hacked. In this, unrelated. This point. Yeah, unrelated. Not unrelated, unrelated. But that happened to be the software they chose, okay. as Sherry mentioned. They were the, the fourth party in this case. Now, the Rebel ransomware group was able to break into a Colorado-based uh, managed service provider. And this managed service provider was responsible for maintaining about 100 different dental offices. That was kind of their uh, their client base. Uh, the Rebel ransomware group was able to use that remote monitoring and management software to push their malware out to every single one of these, uh, these clients. So all 100 of these organizations were now hit with ransomware. There was a $700,000 demand for a master decryptor uh, so that the, uh, the MSP could, uh, could decrypt all of the clients of theirs that had now been impacted but the MSP refused payment. What made this really bad for us, though, was the fact that the MSP in this case kind of went radio silent on us. We stopped receiving information from them. We stopped receiving updates. We had no idea what their status was. We didn't know if they were fully encrypted or not. Uh, and there were a lot of questions that we had about how they operated that, uh, that would have been useful for building up a better security posture moving forward. Did they use multi-factor authentication on their management interface? Were they sticking with the same software? Were they implementing additional security controls? And we got pretty much nothing from them for weeks on end at this point. It was very frustrating for the uh, the victims. It was also really difficult for us as investigators to you know continue on with our investigation without that information. These things can be really valuable for us. So again, it, it underscores the importance of having that understanding with your third-party providers. If they do suffer a cybersecurity incident and you are inadvertently impacted because of it, what does their responsibility look like? Will they be talking to you? And what kind of information are they going to be expected to provide you at that point?
Yeah, unfortunately, this is all too common with suppliers of all different types. iCare Leaders is another example of a software as a service provider. They have a hosted EMR. They were hacked, and there have been over 2 million patients that were notified as a result of this. Unfortunately, they didn't announce originally that they were hit with a ransomware attack. Instead, they tried to hide it. Um, and their customers figured it out pretty quickly. Um, also, unfortunately, they didn't disclose a ton of information to customers that they needed in order to rule out a potential data breach. And so all of those customers have notification windows that they need to hit. And we started to see uh, different healthcare organizations announcing data breaches as a result of this. So what do you do when a vendor is not available to support you in the way that you expect? Here are some questions uh, to consider when you're choosing or reviewing your suppliers. Will a, a certain supplier notify you if they suspect a breach? Will they notify you if they confirm a breach? And if so, how long is it going to take? A month? Two months? Three months? What evidence do they collect that would help you rule out a breach? Do they collect anything at all? Um, we've seen cases, uh, particularly with Microsoft um, several years ago, where they were not able to give us the information we needed to rule out a breach for a victim because that data was commingled with other com companies' data, and it was just work. It was a lot of work for them to uh, separate that out and actually be able to hand one single person a package of evidence that was just theirs. And when you think about a case where every customer of a supplier might be impacted, that would be extremely hard to do. And well, you might be waiting years, as in the case of BlackBot, or you might never receive that information at all. Finally, who covers the cost? If you have to announce a breach because a vendor was hacked, who's going to cover the cost of that investigation or the notification? If the vendor offers to notify for you, are they going to mention themselves? Are they going to throw you under the bus? What's that going to mean? Um, so just think about who's going to cover that cost, whether you'll have to go to court for a reimbursement, and whether your insurer will cover these third-party breaches. In some cases, we are starting to see coverage limited when it comes to suppliers, and certainly cases where it's a fourth-party supplier, you have even less of a chance of getting costs recovered as as well. So the bottom line here is uh, we really want to involve our suppliers in our response and security planning. So make sure that your supplier contacts are maintained in your incident response plan. They're kept up to date. You want to maintain a single point of contact for suppliers to report incidents to you. And then if somebody's on vacation in your company, you want to make sure another person will still receive that report. And then identify your high priority suppliers back to our classification, data classification, asset classification, and prioritization. Talk to your high priority suppliers about incident response. Make sure you understand how responsive they'll be, when they'll be responsive, what their limitations are, and see if you can include some of them in interactive tabletop exercises. We've talked in the past about how IBM reports that holding regular exercises and testing your incident response plan can actually reduce the average cost of an incident by $2.66 million on average. That is huge. And again, involving your suppliers can really make a difference between a response that goes smoothly and one where the train just goes off the tracks. So involve them when you can. Okay, with that, we've talked about a few top security controls in this webinar, including incident response testing and training. Um, going back to the beginning, data discovery, data mapping, the importance of identity and access management and attack surface monitoring. All of these security controls are important, not just for you, but for your suppliers as well. And so you wanna make sure that they are deploying them appropriately. And finally, we covered five steps to managing your supplier risk, everything from developing your processes, know yourself and your suppliers, delegate requirements through contracts, assess your supplier risk, not just once, but regularly, and finally, integrate suppliers into your response planning. If you have any questions, feel free to drop us a line on LinkedIn or reach out. My name is Sherry Davidoff. This is Matt Duren. Please hit the like button, and we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar. Thanks again. Thank you, Matt and Sherry. We did have a few questions that came from our audience during the presentation. First question is, what do I do if my supplier won't include any security-related provisions in my contract? 
Ooh, that is a tough one. I mean, you really want to have, be working with suppliers that respect security needs um, and are willing to work with you on that. And it, there may be some softening of language, but these days it is becoming pretty standard to have some security requirements from suppliers. Um, if you really are working with a supplier that won't budge at all, I'd say that's a red flag and you should be looking at other suppliers. And if you need to, you know, consider looking at other suppliers, getting quotes, see which other ones you can work with and go Go back to your original supplier and let them know what you're seeing as standard in the industry and see if, if that helps in your negotiations. Great. Thank you, Sherry. The next question was, how do I stop my API keys from leaking? It's a good question. Uh, when we're talking about uh, API keys leaking from software, this is a common problem with software development. And really the answer to it is use or make sure that the organizations you are working with who are either developing or selling you the applications use good coding practices. Don't hard code passwords, don't hard code API keys, and don't basically don't make it easy for a hacker to extract that data from a program. Uh, this is something we see as a very common issue with a lot of software out there. And so just, you know, being wary of it and, you know, being aware of what you can do to stop it in the first place is going to be really helpful. Thank you, Matt. And our last question is, how often should our team be conducting tabletop exercises? Great question. As we've seen, tabletop exercises have become a routine component of your security program because there's nothing like actual practice to make sure that you can operationalize your incident response plan. Typically, the minimum is annually. Do at least one tabletop exercise annually. I'd say if you're a mid-sized business or a large organization, you probably want to do them more regularly than that, maybe two or three per year, if not more, um, because that way you can hit different scenarios and also get different people involved in the response process. I've seen a lot of uh, insurance policies that actually require a tabletop exercise or encourage a tabletop exercise at least annually on ransomware. And then, of course, there's other scenarios that might be high risk for you, like business email compromise, malware infections, and more. Great. Thank you, Sherry and Matt. Once again, this is Tamara with LMG Security. Thank you and have a great day.